tourist resort now, effectively, um, which it wasn't, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So I mean, it's, it, that's the that's the massive change that that those media can can reap, can, can affect. And I don't think I don't see academia doing the same thing, unfortunately. Um, so you need to target popular history, television history, and big screen history, um, which is a tough call, I know, but it's, I think that's that actually brings better results. Um, the problem with that is that a lot of that history is very, very much simplified. It's, it, it just sort of regurgitates national mythologies. So our television history in Britain, for example, is obsessed with D-Day, it's obsessed with the Battle of Britain. It would ne they would never dream of making a documentary about the Nazi Soviet pact because it's too complicated. People don't get it. Right? So it has to, be, has to change gradually. And you have to be able to put, as I said, the analogy of the jigsaw. You have to be able to put a few more pieces of the jigsaw in to anchor your wider narrative to make it make sense. Because at the moment there just aren't enough pieces to make it make sense. But I think if that can be achieved, then that's, that will actually bring greater results, as I said, than any number of academic conferences. Um, the last point, excuse me, about academics again. Um, academics in the same way, I mean that sort of attitude of, uh, in academic history, as I said, it tends to speak to itself. Uh, academic university history is probably even more left-wing in general in Britain than school teaching. Um, so there's, there's, there are even people who are, you know, tenured academics who are Stalin apologists, which is, you know, to me, would not be allowed, but there we go. Um, so, you know, that has its own problems, but as I say, I think, you know, and in that sense, thankfully, uh, I think the influence of academic history is rather limited. So we have to try and target popular history who denied for so many uh, years uh, the, that uh, this secret protocol existed. And this year, you know, it was uh, officially published uh, through one of the foreign ministry um, websites. And uh, so why it was uh, done? So um, what was the reason? How do you see it? Uh, maybe you would find some response in the history because there are so many parallels mm. what happened then and what happens now. Mm. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. I, I, you know, um, I know I've talked with Constantine before about this and I'm sure he'd have a better answer than I have. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I explain it as I said before. I think it's an attempt by the Kremlin in a sense to try and retake re control of the narrative. Because the narrative of, of this period, Nazi Soviet Pact particularly, it's benefited from the fact that you have this enormous you know, gap of ignorance uh, in the Western narrative. It doesn't fit the narrative, so we don't talk about it, so nobody knows about it. Um, so in a sense, they can spout whatever they want, and they have done traditionally, and that will be believed by some people, who are these you know, the apologists of Stalin in the universities, some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might be sort of propagated a little bit, but it, it just sort of it just creates ignorance effectively. Um, and I think there has been a, partially it's social media. So it partially, I think it's the rise of or the, the uh, with the, the the freeing of the liberation of Eastern Europe after 89, 91. Mm -hmm. You have people who are now free to talk about it. They're free to talk to people like me about it, and I will try and change the narrative. So there is another voice there which wasn't there before. So this is challenging that narrative. So there's suddenly you've got other voices, that's, and that's amplified by social media. Um, so you have, I mean, it's very interesting when, when uh, you know, as I said, Mr. Lavrov says whatever he says, or the, the foreign ministry uh, Twitter account says whatever it says. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the responses, very often from Poland and from the Baltic states, saying, are you serious? This is nonsense, you know, and just sort of challenging it, constantly challenging it. And I think that's, I think, in a sense, it's that challenging of the narrative where traditionally it didn't get challenged. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what, what's breeding this insecurity, and this is why they're sort of desperate to get control of the narrative again. So that would be my interpretation. Mm -hmm. There's another interpretation, which is that this is part of a sort of a more aggressive policy. You know, looking at the situation in Ukraine, for example, saber-rattling against you know, NATO aggression in whatever it is, aggression in those commas. You know, in the Baltic states and Poland, and that this is an, an attempt to sort of, in a sense, uh, uh, intimidate the smaller nations of Eastern Europe, saying, look, this is what we did then, and we can do it again. But I don't, I don't know if that's...
fair comment. Mm -hmm. My interpretation would be that it's that it that it's uh, because they're losing control of the narrative. Mm -hmm. I still want to explore the opportunity to discuss uh, about the future. For example, future of the. Uh, I'm a historian. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Me too. <laughs> The future, not very distant. I mean, in uh, in uh, May uh, in the next year, we will have the third conference of uh, the Academy Casablanca of Denmark. One conference already. Uh, the materials were published. You you saw, I suppose, doing this in English. Another mm -hmm. one. It was dedicated for the topic of Europe after Abiyan conference. Why the Western democracies refused to. Yeah. Uh, to open the gates of the Jewish refugees from yeah. from from Europe that, uh, at that time, and uh, uh, for the next May, I am pro I'm proposing the topic of the, uh, the destiny of European conventions in the East mm -hmm. from Germany. Mm -hmm. The fact you mentioned that for the British, for the French people, uh, that East ubi laones subhuman. Nazis watched that the similar way, subhuman thing. Some that wouldn't be the word that the British would use, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but in a sense, no not, one not important. Not, not important. important. Not important. Yeah. 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 means that uh, we know very well about the different, demonstrating the different behaviors of the Nazis, the, the say, French war prisoners or British yeah. or American, yeah. and, and the Soviet yeah. or Polish. Different way. Yeah. And uh, that uh, touches the case of Katyn. Yeah. Katyn, this massacre uh, um, completed by the Soviets, again, so brutally uh, behaving against any conventions with the <coughs> human beings. And what do you think about that uh, topic for joint? Uh, East Central European and Western European historians about the fate mm. of conventions, about yes, civilizational, even civilizational, yeah. uh, uh, early civilizational clashes that yeah. you can behave yeah. in the East differently. Yes, than you. I think it's true. I mean, there's there's a good point that um, um, Tim Snyder makes in I think the, I think it was Black Earth, his book about the Holocaust, where uh, he talks about sort of deliberate creation. Um, of, a, of, a, of a lawless space where none of this stuff actually matters. None of this, you know, the legal protections of, of being a citizen, of, of, uh, of you know, the, the instruments of state are no longer extant. All of that stuff is deliberately demolished uh, as a prelude to being able to do what you want with those people. And I think that's an important point to remember that, you know, this is the I mean, same thing in Poland. You have this deliberate destruction of Poland. And then you have a mass of people with whom you can effectively do what you want. And then, of course, you have that amplified after the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, but the, the wider question of, of this ideological warfare, and this is one that, again, completely clashes with the Western narrative. Um, and I've, I, the new book, um, this is very, very clear. And I'm not, I, you can tell it very clearly with statistics. If you look at the statistics for massacres in the French country, um, there are a total of about 25 massacres by the Germans carried out in the French campaign. Um, and that's pretty bad anyway. I mean, that's, that's pretty shocking and it would be awful to, you know, you know to be involved in that. Um, most of them, interestingly, carried out by the SS. Most of them, the vast majority, are carried out against French colonial troops. Right? Dark-skinned French colonial troops. That's something we don't really hear anymore. There are a couple of examples. There are two massacres of British POWs, one at a place called Vormhout and one at a place called Le Paradis, uh, where British POWs are massacred, uh, you know, lined up with a machine gun. Uh, but only two. And those, obviously, uh, uh, are very significant in the British narrative. This is, oh, the horror of the Nazi rule, all of this stuff. Now, if you look at what was going on in 1939 in Poland, which is a, a campaign of comparable length, Six weeks versus five weeks. Um, Germans alone carry out something like 600 massacres. 
Right? So it's about 15 for every day of the campaign, on average. Now, what's, what's the difference? What drives that difference? Why the disparity? Okay? Now, there are various factors that might feed into it. Inexperienced troops, uh, the result of you know, Blitzkrieg creates the environment in which civilians are often targeted, in which anyone caught behind the line can be interpreted as a, as a partisan or a bandit or whatever, however they want to describe it. So there are various factors that might potentially explain it, but they are, they are both extant in both cases. The same thing happens in France in terms of use of Blitzkrieg. The same thing happens in Poland in 39. So the only fundamental difference is how those troops view the people that they are then suddenly in control of. And in the French case, in the British case, they see them as fellow Europeans, human beings, fundamentally. And in the Polish case, they don't. These people are not worthy of your time. So if a village, you know, if there's a shot fired at you from the village, you burn the village down. It's as simple as that. And you see that in, in case after case after case. Now, we know that that happens. In the Western narrative, we know that happens after 41. Because we've kind of we kind of bought into the Soviet narrative of, of, of their tremendous suffering after 41. So we know that from 1941. But no one has ever really said that about 1939. So the narrative in the Western case of the war, in terms of atrocities, is that you have this, this is, which is the wrong narrative, is that the brutalization, the barbarization of warfare is something that develops from a relatively chivalrous start. Yeah, right. Uh, up to you know step change in 41 and then it gets sort of accelerating barbarism as the war goes on. And that is completely wrong. And I think I proved that that's wrong by looking at the Polish campaign in some depth. Because that barbarism is there right from the outset, that ideological warfare. The Germans go in with a race war mentality. They are willing to commit race war against the Polish people and, the Pol and Polish Jews as well. And in the same way the Soviets are doing very similar things. There are a lot of massacres. Um, particularly the officer class, particularly of people who are you know, rounded up from you know, administrative positions and so on. Uh, a lot of massacres uh, in the Soviet case as well. So you've got ideological warfare in already in 1939. You've already got the barbarization of warfare. So it's not something that just develops. That's a complete Western misconception. So I think, you know, on both counts, I think you're absolutely right. And that should be a very rich field for uh, examination.